bringing hope to many around the globe, transforming lives into legacies. Live in Word with Pastor Mensah Otobiel. And now, today's word. In the book of Numbers chapter 14, we're going to read an account that is very instructive on the power of words. God himself told the children of Israel when they were in bondage, God himself came to Moses and said to Moses, I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt. And I'm sending you Moses. Go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Go where? God says, I am delivering them from bondage to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. God declared his express intention, his purpose. And he started working out what he had said he would do. The people were delivered. Pharaoh was squashed. The enemy they feared was no longer there. The people entered the wilderness. Normally, it should have taken about 40 days to get to the promised land. But the moment they entered the wilderness, they started digging their graves with their words. And everything they said was negative. God then sent, told Moses to send spies to go and see the promised land. This land that he has promised them was theirs. It was their land. And the 12 spies go and they come back. They see the land is exactly as God said it is. But the people come back. 10 of them say the land is exactly as God says it is. But We cannot possess the land. The cannot spirit. There are people who speak with cannot. It can't be done. It has never been done. It will never happen over my dead body. That can never be done statement. They look at the land and they said we cannot take it. It's impossible. It can't be done. It has never been done. It won't be done. And if it will be done, not us. And sometimes I hear black people talk that way, Africans. It can't be done. We, are, we can't do it. Only white men can do it. And we dig our own underdevelopment with our tongue. So, the ten of them say it cannot be done. But there are two people whom the Bible describes as having a different spirit. Joshua and Caleb. And they say, hey, 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 hey. There's another side to this story. This thing can be done. And if God be for us, we can possess the land. And the people say, shut up. Let's face facts. It can't be done. So listen to what happened. Numbers chapter 14, 1 to 4. Follow this carefully. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained. Note that word. Complained. Complaining spirit. Complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness. Idle words. Why has the Lord brought us to the land to fall by the sword? That our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader. And return to Egypt. I'm sure they were exercising their democratic right. They say. It would have been better. If we had died in Egypt. And it would have been better. If we die in this wilderness. In other words. 
dying in this wilderness is better than occupying the promised land. And so they complain. Complaining spirit. Tell your neighbor, be careful of complaining spirit. Okay. Complain (laughs) can imprison you. Many times, you see, life can be hard. You may face impossibilities. You may have all kinds of problems. But you have to be careful the language you speak. You have to be careful. And listen, let's go down to verse 27 and 31. Listen to how God responds to what the people said. Now... Now, God is speaking. God says, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. Except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. And you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said will be victims, I will bring in. And they shall know the land which you have despised. God speaks to the people and says, listen, I know the problem, but I have promised you the land. And let me tell you, God knows the end from the beginning. When God tells you, I will bless you. He has also seen the problems. But he has concluded that in spite of all the problems, he will bless you. When God pronounces a blessing upon you, he is not oblivious to the problems around you. He is aware of the problems, but he has spoken ahead and spoken through the problems to your destiny. God knew that there were enemies in the land. God knew there were giants in the land. God knew there were people out there to defend the land. But he told them and he said he swore to give them the land. But the people went to the place God has sworn to give them. They saw the problems and started complaining. And God says, you said dying in the wilderness is better. Than going to the promised land. Okay. I've heard. And what you have spoken to my hearing. Is what I will create for you. And since you think dying in the wilderness is better. Than going to the promised land. So be it. A whole generation. Who have a promise on their lives. Who have been. Who have a sworn word of promise of God over their lives. Perished like carcasses, like animals. People will say, ah, why are the people dying? Why are the people dying? Do you know the words they were speaking? God says, I swore. In other words, there are certain things we can do to nullify God's intentions for our lives. He has good intentions for us, but we can nullify them. So, the first thing is that God knows the words we speak. You think you are just complaining about problems. And you are talking negative. As for, as for the way things are going, we will all die in this country. Oh. You and who? If you want to die, don't recruit me. As for this country, you can't build a house. Oh. You will work out 40 years, you won't build a house. You and who? You and who won't build a house? If you won't build a house, don't build yours. But when God sees me and you, whoever your name is, and before the foundation of the world, 
There are about 200 or so countries in the world. But he decides that I should be born in this country called Ghana. And then he teaches me his word in this country called Ghana. And he tells me he will make me the head and not the tail in this country called Ghana. Do you think God did not know the Ghanaian problems? He saw it. He knew the problems. He knew what would happen. He knew when we'll have independence. He knew all the coup d'etats. He knew how inflation would be. He knew all the problems. But he said to you, my son, if you trust me, I will make you the head and not the tail. I will bless you wherever you go. And when God said that to me, he was aware of the country I was in. He knew I was not born in Germany. He knew I was not born in France. He knew I was not born in America. He knew I was born in Ghana. That is what he has sworn to me. So when I see Ghana going through difficulty, I don't include myself and say, huh, the way things is, we we'll all die here. You and who? You and who will die here? You say, ah, ah, the way things are going, I don't think we can make it. As for me, I don't think I can make it. This guy, you can't build a house. You can't buy a car. That's fine. Say it for yourself. <laughs> but I won't join you in that. God hears what you say. We reap the results of the negative words we constantly use. The words we constantly use. Complaining. And God says, how long? That gives me the impression it wasn't as if they just complained once and changed. But they've been doing it over and over and over. The negative talk has become a national character. But you can sit around the blessing and complain. That's your democratic choice. You have it. You have a right. You have a right to kill yourself. That's, that's your right. But as for me and my house. The third thing you notice is that those who speak in agreement with God reap his favor. Because in the midst whilst he's saying to some people, your carcasses will fall in this wilderness. He says, but I have isolated some people. And those people, they will enter the land. That means that even when the whole nation or the masses speak negative, a minority can speak positive. And those who speak the right words according to the word of God will not inherit the curse over the majority. God knows how to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. So you let everybody speak negatively, but you choose your own destiny. And that does not mean that the economy is right and that there is no corruption and that things may not be wrong. Those are realities. They are observable, but I don't claim them as my inheritance. I don't possess them to determine the outcome of my life. My destiny is not linked to who is president of Ghana. My destiny is not linked to which party is in power. My destiny is linked to what God has said about me and what he's able to do for me and what I believe that he will do for me. I serve an eternal God. He sits on the throne permanently. Fourth thing. God is able to redeem children from the negative words of their parents. God said to the people, Although you spoke these negative things, I will isolate your children from the consequences you are about to experience. May God deliver you from the curses of your father. May God deliver you from the curses of your ancestors. Because God delivered the children from the curses of their fathers. Because he says that the children that you said will not inherit the land. They are the ones who inherit it. And they did inherit the land. And definitely Joshua and Caleb inherited the land. And Caleb was so bold when he entered the land to ask for the difficult problems to solve. He said, give me this mountain, this impossible situation, and I will solve it at the age of 85. He had a different spirit. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Be careful what you say. 
speak. If you are commenting about the situation in Ghana, speak objectively as the problem in the nation. But don't claim it as the deciding factor for who you will become. Now we've seen how negative words work. Let's see how faith must speak. If you are walking by faith, how do you speak? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 13. The Apostle Paul gives us an idea. He gives us an insight into how people of faith must speak. And uh, that should become the pattern for your language. He shows us how it's done. Second Corinthians, are you there? Chapter 4, verse 8 to 13. If you are talking about a person who had problems, I know many people have problems, but I'm telling you, this guy, Paul, had problems. He had problems from everywhere. Shipwreck, being whipped, being stoned. I mean, he, name it, he's gone through it. False accusation, hunger, everything. But then this is how he speaks. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Christ may be manifested in our body. For who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. So how does faith speak? Faith speaks what it believes. And how does faith speak what it believes? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So God says it. You hear it, you believe it, and that's what you say. So you can say there is perplexity all over. But I, I'm not in despair. I have, been, I have been beaten, I've been struck down, but I will not be crushed. He acknowledges the reality, but he isolates himself from the consequences of the reality. And he says, just because I am hard pressed, does not mean that my life is over. I'm here to tell you, my friends, you can be hard-pressed sometimes. Life can be difficult. You look at your children sitting at home. They've been sacked and the school fees have not been paid. And you don't have the money and your husband is dead. And you look at those children. It's a reality. You are hard-pressed. But you have to look at those children and say, as long as the Lord God Jehovah lives, your life will not be destroyed. Your destiny is secure in Christ. You will be the head and not the tail. You have been sat from school, but your education has not been cut short. The landlord comes and he ejects you from your house. You have been abandoned or you have been thrown away, but you are not forsaken. You don't pick your things and say, hmm, the way life is... I don't think I'll ever build a house. You look at that and you say, thank you, Lord. Because I know what you are going to do for me. That you will give me the ability to build my own house. So no landlord will come and eject me again. Don't allow the circumstance you go through to brand you as a failure permanently. The words of your mouth must become words of faith. Amen. Thank you for listening to Living Word. To interact with Pastor Mensa Otebe, like his page on Facebook. Follow him on Twitter at Mensa Otebe. Email 
Otterville at centralgospel.com or call plus 233-302-688-000.